Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of the Webinar Wednesday with Hawkridge Systems. My name is Tim Milo, and I'm here with my colleague, Ryan Magruder, who will be going through some Abacus drop test example and some multi-physics work. All right, so today we're going to go through a bottle drop using Abacus Explicit. Uh, we're going to introduce some of the CEL and particle methods, and then we'll get into the Abacus interface a bit and show you the Abacus drop test plugin. My colleague Ryan Magruder will, will show some customization we can do there and some result visualization and then tie it back for questions. All right, so for a bottle drop test, what we're gonna go through today is a sort of simplistic physical model coupled with some complex physics. We'll have a couple re different representation for fluids what we call a CEL on the left or smooth particle hydrodynamics, which you can see on the right. Um, the basic setup for this is that we have a bottle that we drop from a one meter drop height. Um, and what we wanna do here is look at whether we can predict um, problems with the bottle, uh, material plasticity or, or other damage to this. Um, you know, we can always make a, a stronger bottle by making it thicker, but there are some economic trade-offs there. So in the best case, we come up with an ideal thickness to, to resist common load that it's going to see. So we're going to go into that a little bit. So some of the reasons that we go to Abacus for uh, advanced damage models and for simulating these impact events is that it has what we call an explicit solver. Um, this is a solver well situated for extreme deformation events like you see on the left or the, the forming uh, or the, the collapse buckling load like you see in the middle. Um, some of the material capabilities built into Abacus are progressive damage and failure and fracture models. Um, there is a general contact algorithm which allows to detect for contact between any elements in the model. Um, and again, some of these advanced failure models, you can either use uh, material test data directly or you can enter parameters as you've uh, gathered the, this advanced material information. So I'm going to submit another poll at this time. I uh, would like to get some information about where you use FEA analysis in the design process. Basically, we'd like to know whether you tend to use FEA up front to qualify design prospects uh, or late in the process once you know your loadings and your materials. Or I suppose forensically maybe other if you uh, an analyze your system when you see failures to understand them better. All right, looks like we've got pretty good response here. We're finding that around half use it early in the process to qualify design candidates. 40% um, aren't doing FEA and around 10% uh, are using it to qualify for known loads. So I wanna go into some of these multi-physics models that we're using in, in the background of our drop test. Um, the first is going to be coupled Eulerian Lagrangian method. Um, most FEA is uh, is done with uh, Lagrangian method, and what that means is we have 3D continuum elements in a Lagrangian framework where nodes are fixed to material data points. Um, the relative motion of the nodes comes from the element shape functions. Some advantages of this method are that it's very easy to track free surfaces for loads, constraints, and interaction, and that this post-processing is straightforward. Where we run into challenges under extreme deformations are when we have large strain gradients which cause nest distortion, uh, the elements degrade and we have uh, less accurate solution. And in our explicit dynamics simulations, we may have a reduction of the stable time increment so that the explicit solution runs for a very long time or that we just can't finish the solution. Uh, in Abacus, CEL was introduced in 2008. What that brings is that Eulerian modeling can effectively model massive deformation and fluid flow. It's a volume of fluid approach which tracks the material advection through a fixed mesh. Uh, you may notice the, the bottle tumbling that's bounded by a box on the top right. Um, 
What that means is that the Eulerian mesh can track with the Lagrangian structure so that you don't need a larger Eulerian mesh that you just have enough elements to track where the fluid is within uh, a bounded box. Advantages of this is that we, again, we get away from element distortion since the mesh is fixed and we can allow for very large deformations such as sloshing or fragmentation. Um, one of the, the difficulties of this method is that it can become difficult to track free surfaces since elements are neither full or empty, they're partially full and there, there's some subjectivity of that cutoff point. Uh, so post-processing can be challenging and it can require a very large mesh depending on the, the boundaries of where your fluid may be and what your structure is that you interact with. Here are some examples uh, executed with coupled Eulerian Lagrangian. Um, Eulerian by itself is not so useful, but once we take the capability of the deformable structure to influence the fluid, then we can do some pretty advanced physics. Um, you can see the tank on the left with uh, impacting projectile where we have some material failure and some direct interaction of the projectile with the fluid. Uh, on the top right, we have a, a tire going through a very viscous, like a mud type of material. And then on the bottom right, we have um, assessment for hydroplaning where we look at a tire's capability of cutting directly through a fluid. And then last in the middle, we have tank sloshing example. Another method that we can use to, to couple and look at uh, fluid structure interaction is smooth particle hydrodynamics. Um, this can be used both for fluid and for mechanics. Um, in our examples here, we're going to take a look at a little bit of each. And uh, in our abacus uh, run that we're going through, we did only use the, the fluids model, but we'll touch on what goes into the mechanics models as well. Smooth, hard, smooth particle hydrodynamics is a meshless Lagrangian approach that's available in abacus explicit. It's a good technique for simulating problems with huge deformations and damage. And what happens is we convert from a normal FE element into a SPH element at a certain trigger. This could be either a certain time, uh, time in the analysis or it could be a stress state. Uh, the novelty of SPH is that it's a specific method for interpolation and differentiation within a regular grid of macroscopic particles. So what that means is that we can get continuous results without uh, severe distortion of any elements. And how that works is that we have a particle that interacts with a certain amount of surrounding particles and we have some control over how finely the solid elements are discretized into SPH particles and how many of those will interact with each other. Here you can see an example of the structural mechanics uh, implementation of SPH where we have a solid particle going through a plate where when certain stress levels are reached, the plate turns to SPH elements. So again, some of the key advantages of SPH over Lagrangian and Eulerian methods is if we have free surface boundaries and or if we have a small material to void ratio, in CEL, we would need to model the entire mesh where a fluid could be present, but in SPH, we're only dealing with the fluid and um, deformations where we have fragmentation. So things like the uh, impactor on the armor plate or uh, bird strike scenarios. Um, and so for things like impact fracture, spraying and compaction, uh, SPH has some advantages over CEL. Here we have a, another structural mechanics example of SPH where um, ice impact analysis was done. Basically some experimental uh, data was taken shooting ice through a tube and compared with where we can get with analysis. Um, here the main takeaway is that we can capture that shape of that um, particle pretty well, including up to the, the extreme, the cracking where we have the longitudinal patterns both in the um, experimental setup in the top right and in the, in the analytical implementation in the bottom. So you can see 
through uh, a fairly simple modeling approach of just modeling a, a round sphere, we can get a pretty powerful way to, to see how these structures are going to degrade and fail in an in a extreme event. And then lastly, just going to show you that the, the results track pretty well. There's quite a bit of variability through all the different uh, impacts that they measured, but the overall trends are very close between FEA and the experiments for the, the ice impact. The last of the particle methods I want to touch on is discrete element method. Um, this is a method which is good for tracking many different types of particles in a mixing situation. It's a very simple physical model where we have the compliance of these elements built into the contact model. And what this allows, again, is a, a, a simplistic way to track elements through a sorting or other types of um, material moving. It's not represented um, solid mechanics or fluids, but, it, but it's a good way to, to track particle movement. And then last, I want to just go into kind of a comparison of the computational expense of, of the two equivalent fluid methods we covered. The, uh, the SPH tends to be, say, two-thirds the compute time as CEL or less. Uh, in, the, in the runs that we've observed, it was more drastic, but basically SPH can give you a lot of the same resolution at a bit quicker expense computational time. So now I'm going to transition over to my colleague Ryan, who's going to go through some of the details of the bottle drop test that we ran and some of the customizations to the plugin uh, for drop test that's available from Simulia that made this possible. Thanks, Tim. So we'll be looking at this um, this case study that you see here on the screen. We've got the Eulerian mesh over there on the left, and then the SPH study on the right. So we'll be taking a look at that uh, Eulerian setup. And we'll be using one of the plugins available through the Simulia knowledge base uh, called the drop test plugin. And that's going to help us set up the study and automate a lot of the steps that we would normally have to set up manually. And so that drop test plugin is one of the many plugins available that allows us to extend the capabilities of Abacus by running either scripts or GUI toolkit commands. Um, there are a lot of these available through the Simulia knowledge base, and you can definitely uh, create your own as well, or take one and modify it to, to meet your own needs, um, like we've done a little bit with this drop test plugin. Uh, the drop test plugin specifically is going to go through a number of steps, including orientating your assembly, um, specifying some initial conditions based on the drop height and the gravitational constant that you enter, um, and it also creates a rigid floor for the object to impact. And so to start out, uh, we uh, use SOLIDWORKS to model this bottle here that you can see on the left, uh, just because we like to utilize SOLIDWORKS for those modeling capabilities. And then we use the SOLIDWORKS associative interface to import that model into Abacus. And that associative interface offers us a one-click tool for importing that geometry that's going to keep the link between Abacus and SOLIDWORKS so that we can push design changes that we make in SOLIDWORKS into Abacus without having to redefine our whole analysis. And so with that said, let's jump over to Abacus and take a look at this model that we've got set up. And what you should see on screen now is that bottle that we have in Abacus that we've imported over from SOLIDWORKS. And uh, we've got a few other setup additions that we've made in advance that we can take a look at. So let's go through and uh, just work our way down the Abacus module tree here and finish our setup before running that plugin. Our parts module is the first one, and this is where we would create or modify any actual geometry that we're working with. In addition to the bottle and the actual cap that we've got imported from SOLIDWORKS, we've also got this CEL fluid region that we need to find uh, to capture that water that we're trying to analyze inside the bottle. Uh, this part should be modeled large enough so that it captures any area that the fluid may possibly move through. And we've also got it partitioned in advance so that we have a region that is specifically laid out to just show us where the fluid is going to be in its initial state. And we can show that here. And 
And so that region is just going to be inside the bottle where the water is going to start at the beginning of the analysis. And this is something that we've got up set up in advance, and it's going to help us later down the line when we need to finish our definition of that Eulerian part instance. And the last thing that we need to do to set that is just to make sure that if we take a look at the part properties, we've got that set to Eulerian as opposed to the deformable options that we have for the bottle and the cap. Next up, we can work our way down the module tree to the property module, where we've got some properties defined for the bottle, for the cap, and for that fluid. And we can show them all here. So for the cap, we're just using an ABS. Um, for the bottle, we have a stainless steel. And then for the fluid, we just have some properties defined here to capture a simple water property. For that, we'll need the dynamic viscosity, the density, and then an equation of state there. And that's all we'll need with the um, with the additional definition of the Eulerian part instance to capture that behavior. We've also got the bottle, which is a, a vacuum water bottle modeled as shells. And if we take a cut section here, we can see that. And we've got a few different shell definitions defined there just to capture that thick, the larger thickness um, that's going to be at the bottom of the bottle versus the top. Um, which is how the bottle is actually modeled in real life. So we've got multiple shell thicknesses defined there on the bottle. Moving down to the assembly module, we can see that we've already got those parts instanced in our, assemb uh, in our assembly from the SOLIDWORKS Associative Interface. Uh, if we show all the parts here, we can see that Eulerian part instance there, instance with everything else. And we just want to make sure that that's modeled around the bottle itself. And we've given it some clearance there on the bottom to make sure that we are putting it around the entire bottle so that anywhere that the fluid is going to go is going to be captured by that part instance. We can skip the step module for now. The drop test plug will actually take care of that for us. And we can move down to the interaction module where the last part of our pre-setup has been done. And all that we've done there is specified a tie constraint between the cap and the rest of the bottle uh, to represent those physical threads that would actually be holding them together in real life. Uh, but for the purpose of the analysis, we've just removed those for simplicity's sake. And so with that done, we can actually open up our drop test plugin here by going uh, to our plugins dropdown and then selecting it. And we can see that um, that same image here that we had in the slideshow, that drop test plugin. The plugin is going to allow us to specify the model's orientation, either by rotating it about one of the global axes uh, or by the yaw, pitch, and roll rotations. We're also going to be able to specify the gravitational acceleration constant and specify the height. And that's going to give us an initial velocity once we move over to the model. And the last option down there at the bottom is going to be the total time duration, where we can specify the amount of time that we're going to be simulating the impact. and then. The extra box that we have here is a customization that we've made to the plugin ourselves that allows us to create a mass scaling feature in the explicit dynamic step with a target time increment. And so this can be done manually after running the plugin as well, uh, but customizing the plugin to include this allows us to automate another step in that process that, meet, that we may want to use. And so if we enter in some values here, we can see what the, the plugin is going to do for us. Once we're in a meter for the drop height, just to, remembering that we modeled the bottle in millimeters. And we'll set up a time step there. So now we have the new model that the plugin has created. If we look over here on the left in the tree, we can see that new model that the plugin's made for us. If we take a look at the screen, we can see that it's already gone through much of that setup for us. Uh, we can see that it's rotated the model about that axis that we specified. It's also modeled that rigid floor part um, that we had that the, the bottle is going to contact. And if we zoom in here, we can see that the floor has been placed at the lowest point of the bottle itself, not the Eulerian part instance. And this is another customization that we've made to the model itself just to make sure that it's ready to run for this particular example with a Eulerian part instance. Um, instead of searching for the lowest point of the whole model, we've just had it exclude the Eulerian part instance when it's searching for that to make sure that we've got it set right at the, the tip of the bottle so that we're not wasting any additional analysis time waiting for that bottle to impact the floor. 
working our way down the tree here back to that um, step module, which we skipped over before, we can see that we've now got an explicit dynamic step. And if we take a look into that step, we've got the time period assigned as well as that target time increment for our masculine that we entered into the, um, to the plugin there. Moving over to the interaction module, we do have that tie constraint that we defined earlier that was um, brought over through the plugin. And we have also, if we look over in the tree, we've also got general contact defined here. And so this general contact feature is a, a, a one-click contact feature. It's all that we need to have defined. It's something that the plugin is going to create automatically. And this is going to cover the contact between the bottle and the rigid floor as well as the contacts between the water and the bottle itself. And so this feature will capture both of those. There's nothing else that we need to do here. Um, all of the settings that are brought over with the plugin are just defaults uh, in the software. So a very simple way um, to capture all of the contacts that's occurring in this model and something that is done automatically through the plugin for us. If we keep moving down the tree here, we move down to our load module. And so this is where we didn't put anything in in advance. This is all taken care of through the plugin. Uh, if we come down into the tree, we can take a look at our loads. We have a gravity load applied, um, which is going to be in accordance with that value that we entered into the plugin. We've got a boundary condition that's just holding the floor in place. And then in our predefined field, here's that initial velocity that's going to apply to all the parts. So it's going to apply this to the Eulerian part instance. It's going to apply it to the bottle and the cap. And this is just going to be defined um, with a value in accordance to that drop height and the gravitational constant that we entered. So the last thing that we need to do here is to actually tell the software where the water is going to be at the start of the analysis. All that we've done so far is just instance that um, Larian part instance in there. As far as the software knows, uh, you know, there's no definition of where the water actually is. And so to do that, we can use another predefined field here. If we create one of these and we set our step to the initial and we use a material assignment, it's going to ask us for an Larian part instance. We can select that. And then in this predefined field option, one of these options that we can use here is to select the region that the fluid is going to be occupying. And there are other ways that you can do this. You can use an intersection of another part, for example, uh, if you don't want to partition up that Eulerian part instance like we did initially. Um, but for this region here, if we select it, we can come down to that set that we already created. And we can specify that that set that we're using is going to be completely full of fluid. And this is a, a void ratio, and that's the method that we're using here, as opposed to um, using an overlapping discrete field. And so that predefined field then is set, and um, that's all that we would need to do to set up this analysis. And so that drop test add-in is going to do a lot of that work for us. Uh, it's even going to create a job down here with that model name already set up and ready to go. Um, and from here, we could run the analysis and it would be able to go through. Uh, we have one preset up in advance, so let's load that up and take a look. So we can see our results here to get a clear look. Uh, let's just hide some of these, um, these cells. So the first thing we'll do here is just hide this entire uh, part instance. And then we'll switch this to elements and we'll just grab half of the bottle here so that we can take a look inside the bottle to see what that water is doing. And once we got that, we'll just flip it around. So to show that water inside of the bottle, uh, we can switch our view cut manager here. And one of the options when we have that CL part defined is this void and selecting it is gonna allow us to see just that water in there. And if we animate it, then we can take a look at that water flowing in the bottle. Using our visualization tools, we can color those just to make it a bit easier to see. And we can see here the bottle's initial impact as it rises up, and then we can see that as the water moves up and comes into contact with the top of the cap, the bottle is going to accelerate upwards like we'd expect, and we can gain some insights there on how that water is going to impact it. And um, certainly, if you were running multiple analyses with the bottle, at varying levels of fullness, you'd be able to get some information there on, on how that's going to impact um, the bottle itself. And if we take a look at a contour plot, then we can take a look at some of the, the stresses or the strains there in the bottle, uh, particularly the plastic strain here. If we wanted to look at the corner there of the bottle, 
we can take a look at some of the plastic strain there occurring on the corner. And we can use, in addition to that animation, we can go to the frame selector here up in the top right, and this is going to allow us to step through that analysis um, frame by frame. Let me grab it over here. And the amount of frames that we have is all dependent on what we've set up in advance to pull out of the analysis, and so this can be as fine or as coarse as you need it to be, um, and it should give us a good representation of that fluid going through. And so that's all that uh, that there is for this example. And so the drop test plugin, again, automates a lot of that work that we would need to do in advance. Um, and it certainly can uh, allow you to set up a bunch of these uh, very quickly and uh, get those all fired off to see some results from some different steps. And so with that, let me get back to our, our PowerPoint here. And let me turn it back over to Tim here to, to take a look at some of the differences between the CL and, and a separate SPH run that we had. Yeah, thanks, Ryan, for walking through that. Um, yeah, so I think we touched on that some of the uh, some of the computational benefits of SPH over CEL. And in our in our analysis, we covered uh, almost exclusively covered the CEL. Part of that is for the, the difficulty of broadcasting these things being uh, animated throughout their history in real time. Uh, coming back to the comparison of the two, even though CEL gives you slightly more realistic loads in the case of a fluid that's completely full, um, there are some advantages to the, the SPH method in our, in our runs as well. Um, for one, in this particular case, the SPH runs in under four minutes. Um, so either of these could be used, if we're going to use the, the CEL or SPH, we can use them to find the loads that are imparted on a structure. And then in terms of the bottle drop, we could do something like if we want to see is a lid going to pop open, we could add, uh, we can add a mechanism with a certain amount of friction that the, uh, that the fluid is going to interact with the lid and, and help you predict whether or not it'll splash. Another benefit of the computationally lighter method that we get with SPH is we can we can kind of zoom in on the damage models available in a mo in a run so you can see on the on the the bottom left of our screen here we have a pretty uh, highly resolved uh, stress state for the bottle so what that lets us do if, if we have a lighter computational uh, availability of a fluid model we can focus the elements of our analysis on the structure. Um, CEL has a requirement that you have three or four fluid elements per uh, individual Lagrangian element. So with SPH, we can sort of get away from that and go with very highly resolved structures combined with uh, less highly resolved fluids if the only goal is to get the inertial effects of the fluid. So we can come up with some pretty detailed assessments of the damage on the outside structure in combination with a, a relatively efficient way to solve that. Um, and of these base case, um, you know, we're getting CEL run or SPH runs on the order of four minutes. And if you look at the two stress plots in the middle, there is a 20% difference, but that can be a good first cut to, to help you identify better design candidates and that you run more highly resolved tests on. So I want to highlight a series that Hawk Ridge has ongoing with Dassault. Um, we have some industry uh, industry experts in various industries coming in to talk about their solutions. Um, throughout this month, we have some going through human simula simulation with virtual testing, highlighting things like the uh, living heart model, which is a, a very complex multi-physics model going through the electrical, the chemistry, and the fluid and structural responses of heart to let you do things like postulate a defect, test valve. Um, and then in the 23rd of this month, we have uh, 
high tech focused event where we're using multi physics to check your reliability of high tech devices. So that's a great series that we've we've got some industry experts focused uh, on some some very detailed topics. You can find those through the Hawk Ridge website on the calendar. So at this point, we're ready to open it up for questions. Um, definitely re reach out to us through hawkridgesys.com and with any questions, any analysis uh, that you may want our help in executing. We have an analysis services division and we're your pool service provider in that sense. So at this point, I'll open it up for questions. And thank you very much for joining the webinar. So it looks like we had a question about the associative interface with Abacus. Um, what that is is an add-on available from Simulia that lets you push your CAD model directly into Abacus from SolidWorks. Um, Ryan touched on the parts and the, the parts and the parts in the assembly are referred to as instances. So all of that information comes through when you use that module. So we had a question about uh, predicting the behavior of the cap. Um, that's one that we can define some different types of uh, elements, say elements with uh, pull-out behavior like a bolt failure in a plastic. Um, we can define a friction. We can explicitly model a cap with a hinge with uh, friction or even preload where we force solve snapping the cap in, and then we drop it and see whether it says snap together. So there's a few different ways that we can get at the, um, you know, the failure of, of the ceiling surface there. Um, we could even have a thin material that, that cracks or ruptures if the lid is moved far enough. Um, so here we have a question about where we've seen Abacus used for drop. And I can say with, um, in personal experience, it's done anywhere that you really need to make sure that the the structure is sound to, to protect people. Um, one example of this is moving uh, nuclear material. If it's in a cask, you need to make sure that the cask um, is still, is uncompromised in any drop. Basically, anytime you move a thing that could kill people, you make sure that the postulated drop is survivable. Um, there is another in, in high tech, I think drop is pretty important in phones. Uh, you know, anybody that's owned a cell phone has probably dropped it. You can do a little bit to, to help mitigate that by adding something soft plastic around it, but these phone companies do want to make sure they'll survive some minimum amount of drop. Um, one of the things you may have noticed in our drop analysis is that we saw a, a lot of damage considering the, the circumstance of the, the drop that we simulated. Um, we get there with a center of gravity over corner drop, which is if you're going to take a product and, and find the worst case, it's, it's finding the center of gravity over a corner where it's instead of uh, spinning out of a drop, it's essentially uh, fully buckling on a corner. Um, so yeah, I back to that question, I would say drop is either focused on uh, safety critical types of um, industries or industries where there is a significant um, impact on the quality of a device surviving expected events like drops. So if, it's, if it would be very expensive to test every drop, it's typically the approach that companies will do this virtually. All right, so it looks like the, the questions are slowing up. Uh, thanks again for joining our Wednesday webinar series. Um, reach out to us uh, with any questions and uh, have a good rest of your day.